quick heads up, this is actually a sequel video, so if you're interested in watching from the start, a link will be up in the top right. Here we are. Howdy everyone, welcome back to Hawaii Part 2 Explained, and today is where everything goes wrong. Murders is the fourth entry in our story, and it's arguably the most important one of them all. This is the point of no return where theories get split up. I'll recap what I've gone over so far so we're all on the same page. Simon and his girlfriend, who I have dubbed Betty, took a trip to Hawaii for their wedding. They had a relaxing date under the stars before having their wedding. During all this, Simon is dealing with a voice in his head, whom I have dubbed Apollo. An indiscriminate amount of time after the wedding, Simon, Betty, and Apollo are taking a stroll through the forest. The title here is self-explanatory, and I don't think I need to get into anything else, so let's just jump into the lyrics. He was in the forest looking to see the trees, but none were there. He found a girl. This first stanza is pretty clever, being a twist on the phrase seeing the forest for the trees. When somebody says that, it means that they're missing the bigger picture for the smaller details. Line 1 sets up that a nondescript he is in the forest, looking for more specifics. In my opinion, this ties directly to my theory about White Ball. If you don't remember, my takeaway from White Ball was that Apollo, the voice inside Simon's head, wanted Simon to discover how the universe works by confronting the gods and going to heaven. The only issue is that Betty is keeping some part of Simon anchored to reality, meaning they can't achieve their goal. Lines 2 and 3 help to solidify the connection. Simon was in the forest looking to see the trees, but he couldn't find any. He could only find Betty instead. I also need to clear something up going forward. Simon and Apollo are the same person. They are not different people sharing one body. Apollo is more or less a very pronounced part of Simon's consciousness. It's a voice in his head telling him what to do, but it's still him. She found the Earl King. Let's take a pause on murders for now. Don't worry, I'll return, but we need to pivot to another piece of media first. Er Konisch, written by Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, is about a father and a son traveling through the woods while a mysterious entity known as the Earl King pursues the boy. He tries to lure the boy away by promising to spend time with him, offering him his daughters for courtship, and telling him lies about how much he loves him. The father, however, is unable to see the Earl King, merely seeing shapes in the mist and leaves. Before they can make it back home, the Earl King strikes, killing the boy in his father's grasp. If you look at this poem, and you compare it to the song Murders, you see some thematic parallels emerging. I want to pull out two threads, the death and the character of the Earl King. Both of these murders take place in a forest within the vicinity of a dearly loved one. It's as if the story is being recreated with Simon and Betty. Let's move into the Earl King. It is a mysterious, invisible thing pursuing one of the main characters, relentlessly giving chase, providing sweet whispers of nothing, and then striking. Does this dynamic sound familiar at all? Based on what I've covered, we have three characters. Betty, someone who has opened the metaphorical bridge to heaven and will die this song. Simon, somebody who loves Betty but cannot see the problem approaching. And Apollo, somebody who has a singular goal in mind and sees getting rid of Betty as the only solution. It's pretty clear to me that thematically, Betty is the son, Simon is the father, and Apollo is the Earl King. What helps to build this idea is the music as well. There's a pretty popular orchestral adaption of the Earl King by Franz Schubert, and some of the leitmotifs that Murders uses are plucked directly from that orchestral version. So it's pretty clear to me that Murders is a remix of the Earl King story. Back to the original line, this part is pretty cut and dry as to what it means. We know that she found the Earl King, and the Earl King is the lover. We know who all these roles are already. She is Betty, the Earl King is Apollo, and the lover is Simon. And if you believe that Apollo is a voice in Simon's head, them being the Earl King and the lover makes sense. I'm going to run with the assumption that there are only two people present here, Simon and Betty, with Apollo whispering to Simon the whole time. They were in the white wood, gambling out to picnic, in the light leaves broke above, then fell below. The first line is very straightforward symbolism. While there is nothing directly tied to white wood, symbolism tied to the color white indicates peace and harmony. Using wood here likely refers to the singular of the noun woods, as in a forest. So we can assume nothing has gone wrong so far. Before we move on, I have to question the use of they here, as I find it a little strange. 
There are some verses that employ an external narrator, and some that imply Simon as the diegetic narrator. Like, the external narrator has knowledge that neither Simon, Betty, nor Apollo would have. So, which of these two options is it? Believe it or not, I think it's both of them. And let me explain why real quick. The Earl King has four characters, the father, the son, the Earl King, and the narrator. And while the father, son, and Earl King interact, the narrator merely watches, giving commentary so the audience can follow along. It extends further than this, though. The Earl King separates who is singing in a genius way. They're separated by pitch being sung. I think Murders replicates this idea, but it does it differently. I think it comes down to pronoun usage. Some stanzas are sung exclusively in third person, using he, she, and they. Others only use I, making a clear distinction. A few of the passages mix the two, but it's very obvious what context they're supposed to lie in. And any passage using a third person pronoun never uses I, only using we. On top of this, every stanza with third person pronouns is observing the story, never directly interacting with it or self-reflecting. And any stanza with first person pronouns is almost definitely Simon. So for this section, we would have a narrator singing about Simon, Betty, and Apollo. Enough of a tangent, let's move into line two. No, I did not spell the line wrong. The song is the word gambling, which means to run and jump playfully. This probably means that they're frolicking out to a picnic. The use of the word gambling here is definitely meant to be a double entendre. Gambling is meant to sound like gambling in this case. Going out to the picnic is a gamble, likely in reference to Betty's safety. This leads us into line 3 and 4 and perfectly demonstrates why the narrator theory makes the most sense here. This is a metaphor about some kind of creature slinking through the treetops. Even if it's light outside, the light isn't revealing, and something is still stirring, giving chase. This implies that this creature is invisible, kind of like how Apollo is to the rest of the world. It's undetectable to everybody except the narrator. I was in the middle ground, looking to find the flowers in the garden, wearying of the hate me, hate me not, wait, they forgot, woe, oh, the rot. Before you say that this section breaks my rule of the narrator and Simon crossover, the first two lines are part of the chorus. The chorus is sung by Simon, but the narrator cuts him off here, instead performing an entirely different verse about something else. You can hear the awkward cut between the two, and it's definitely on purpose. To me, this signals that whatever the chorus represents, Simon is starting to consider it. But it's not major enough for the narrator to let it breathe. This could be for a few reasons, perhaps the narrator doesn't like Simon, but what I believe to be the most likely is that the characters are physically moving to a different location. When Simon and Betty perform an action, such as gambling, walking, or creeping, the third person pronouns come back. So, in the literal sense, Simon and Betty walked over to a patch of flowers and started plucking them. We can gather this because of lines 4, 5, 6, and 7 here. Line 4 is a twist on the loves me, loves me not game. This is where somebody will pluck petals off of a flower to determine if somebody loves them or not. It's also a play on the forget-me-not flower, which is meant to symbolize true love. What is the purpose of this, though? Well, we can see the true intention through the first word, wearying. A wearying action is one that's tiring or boring. Okay, let's piece this one together. The narrator interjects Simon's section with the implication that he is playing a game of hate me, hate me not. The only other person Simon is with is Betty, so to me this implies Simon is being indecisive on if he should do something about Betty right now. This being a line about Simon's indecisiveness to strike is 100% supported by the chorus, which we will get into later. Lines 5 and 6 also support this direction, with a physical and mental reading. Physically, Simon and Betty got bored of picking flowers and left behind a lot of dead ones, hence the rot. Mentally, Simon and Apollo thought it would be the wrong time to act. The rot, in this case, is Simon's relationship. It's quite literally teetering on the edge. Deeper in they crept, oblivious of the bears, and darker tears, or none were there. How did they dare? Line 1 sees our three players moving deeper into the forest, but you could also interpret it as being Simon climbing deeper into his mind. All three of them are moving away from society and witnesses. Lines 2 and 3 continue the theme of an invisible threat being present. Bears are obviously dangerous, but darker terrors are even more threatening. We do have an invisible threat in our mind lurking in the shadows, the Earl King. Line 3 backs up this narrative by saying that there are no visible threats, only the Earl King. It just appears that nothing is there, when there definitely is something. And then line 4 is just a follow up to line 2, emphasizing that Simon and Betty are foolish for going deeper. I was in the middle ground, looking to find the fountain of infinite mirror. 
Tree falling, no one would hear. Shadow of nobody there. Murders of murderers living in fear of it. We finally get to the chorus featuring the perspective of Simon, and I think this whole section is about his fear of following through with Apollo's ideas. Sure, there were hints of this with the flower patch, but the struggle is further fleshed out in this moment. When Simon says that he was in the middle ground, I'm fairly confident that means he's stuck in a symbolic middle between Betty and Apollo. Due to mental factors, he cannot solve his existential crisis and keep his wife. He wants both, but to him, he can't have both. This is a pretty bad catch-22 for him, and I think that's where line 2 gets incorporated. The Fountain of Infinite Mirror is a very interesting concept, and what makes most sense to me is that the fountain is a symbolic representation of self-reflection. The mirror part of that is obvious, mirrors reflect things, and if you want to improve yourself, you need to reflect on your actions. Why is it infinite though? Well, part of becoming a better person is constantly reflecting on your actions. You can't just reconsider what you're doing once and move on. It's an ongoing process. The infinite part also connects with the fountain. Well, fountains can often be seen as symbolic of change and rebirth. They take an old water from the bottom and renew it at the top. All of these elements, when combined together, make the Fountain of Infinite Mirror a symbolic representation of self-reflection and renewal. We can probably assume that Simon has lost the fountain, given his mental state, which is why specifically he's looking for it. Line 3 is pretty explicit, being a riff on the phrase, if a tree falls in the forest and nobody's around, does it make a sound? This is almost certainly in reference to Betty, and Simon even answers the question himself. If she dies in the middle of the forest, Simon thinks, Nobody will realize she's even gone at all. Line 4 is also pretty explicit, assuming you buy into the Apollo interpretation like I do. Apollo does not have a physical body, and yet he looms over Simon, influencing his behavior. Line 5 is more of a doozy. So, as a baseline, a group of crows is called a murder. And earlier in the chorus, Simon talks about the Fountain of Infinite Mirror. Let's rewind to that a little bit and talk about the idea of an infinity mirror. If you put two mirrors near each other, they will infinitely reflect whatever's between them. So, if Simon were to say, look in an infinity mirror, he would see an infinite amount of copies of himself. Because Simon and Apollo are considering murdering Betty, he is calling the infinite versions of himself murderers, and thus, groups of himself would be considered murders. Remember, this section is all about self-reflection, so even though he considers himself a murderer, he's still terrified of going through it. Hence the final bit. He's living in fear of it. The fear of him actually doing the murder. Owls on the night watch, Solomon easily wise to what we thought they thought above. Sound broke below. In verse 3, it likely starts to get dark outside, and our characters are inching deeper and deeper into the forest. We see this in line 1, with owls taking the night watch. The use of owls here not only symbolizes that, but it also symbolizes something with line 2. In pop culture, owls are seen as wise and all-knowing. They are wise to what we thought, what we know is going on, that something bad is taking place. In line 3, the narrator goes to talking about Simon and Betty again. Both sides of the couple are likely clueless as to if or when something will happen. This line also makes it seem as though the characters think they're above the narrator who knows what's going on. Definitely checks out with Simon's character up to this point. Line 4 helps out this interpretation with the word of below. They thought above, but something is happening below. You can read out line 4 in two different ways. Either a sudden noise occurred, similar to the use in broke out in hives, or things got real quiet all of a sudden, as if the sound literally broke. Either reading works, it just indicates that something is happening. They were in the black wood, coveting indiscreetly her for him or him for her, shown what they were. This stands as pretty straightforward, aside from the pretty clever misdirect. In line 1, we have a parallel to earlier in the song with the white wood. For our purposes, the symbolic meaning of black most relevant is death and evil. Things are no longer safe, harmonious. Things are bad now. In line 2, we get a repeat of an idea seen at the end of White Ball. The idea being that Betty ignores Simon Flaws because she loves him so much. Coveting means to desire, and indiscreetly means to make an unwise or poor decision. Put these two together, and it's clear to see the writing on the wall. Line 3 is the misdirect. The line deliberately sets itself up to be the reciprocal statement for Simon, but you have to take this within context of the whole section. Betty is coveting indiscreetly, but Simon is showing what he truly is. This is where I think some kind of weapon is drawn. 
or at the very least, it's almost drawn. Why do I say this? Well, we have a reprise of the chorus one final time. This indicates that Simon is reflecting on his decision one last time before he does it. I was in the clearing, buzzing around to hearing what the bees and birds knew the words. So, importantly, at the start of this section, Simon is no longer in the middle ground. He made his choice, and is thus in the clearing. He is no longer conflicted about what to do, but we don't know what that is yet. We can see this relief in line two with the kind of floaty vibe it carries. At the ending portion of this song, Simon metaphorically becomes a bee, which is carried into line three. This is a fairly explicit reference to the birds and the bees, which uh, I don't think I need to explain to you, but you may be wondering why the birds and the bees are evoked here. Well, I think it's pretty clear, really. It's just another piece of evidence that Simon is the one attacking. We have Simon, a bee, and Betty, his partner, the bird, and they both know what's going on. Simon is going to attack Betty, and Betty understands that she is being attacked. But he doesn't strike just yet. Soon arrive the twilight, finally the night and day remembered how they came to be. This whole sequence is Simon and Apollo finally making their move. In line one, the twilight is likely symbolic of a turning point. It is the transition between the day and the night, so Simon likely views this moment as a major turning point. Lines two and three completely back this up, with a night and the day split. And then the song moves into purely music, and leitmotifs from the Earl King reappear. The Earl King has struck, and the music slows to a crawl as the harsh piano becomes soft and regretful. All for nothing at all With something to do Instantly, Simon regrets his decision, realizing that it did not give him the answers Apollo told him it would. He killed the person he loves. All for Nothing at All is a reference to Frank Sinatra's All or Nothing at All. In the song, Sinatra sings about how love could not be halfway, or else he will be dragged down by it. Simon, in his efforts to split things between his wife and his crisis, ruined the relationship. He did not give it his all, and it's his fault. And line three demonstrates that. It's something to do with him. I was in the forest looking to see the trees, but none were there. The final two lines are a reprise of the beginning. Everything goes full circle. Up until now, it could only be inferred that Simon was the he in the song based on context clues. This moment, this ending stinger, seals it as Simon's actions. He did it. He took somebody's life. This also relates back to his goal in White Ball. Even without Betty, there were no details. He is still lost and confused, but even more so without her. And thus ends murders. So this would be where this wraps up normally, where I just go through any details I might have missed or like put aside, but I don't really have that. However, there is one particular topic that I want to discuss. See, my interpretation is pretty different than what is considered normal. The majority of fans believe in a different theory, that Simon was framed. And I genuinely hate this theory. It makes a large part of the album incoherent and messy. And you know what? I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna debunk the Simon was framed theory to the best of my ability. If you came here purely for my analysis of murders, then... I think you've got everything you want out of this video, but if you want to see me talk a little more broadly about Hawaii Part 2 and its fandom, uh, you should keep watching. So roughly, here's the most common interpretation of the first half of the album. Uh, Simon goes to Hawaii, falls in love with a girl, marries her, and then somebody else kills her and then he is punished for that other person's actions. I'm a supporter of uh, being creative and having your own interpretations of media when they have proper evidence to back them up, but in my opinion this theory just kind of spits in the face of all the theming of the first half of the album. It kind of takes the agency away from Simon, in a way. Like, okay, if you believe Simon went to Hawaii alone, that's a valid interpretation. I think Island to Thyself is one of the more confusing songs, and uh, you know, if you glean that as your interpretation, I think that's fine. But 
the Simon was framed theory just doesn't make a lot of sense with the knowledge we have. You really have to bend the lyrics, like really bend them out of shape into wildly different interpretations to really get to Simon was framed. Off the top of my head, the only songs that make about as much sense are Island to Thyself and uh, The Mind Electric when you do this. The biggest issue I have is that it just kind of throws all the foreshadowing from uh, Isle, Black Rainbows, and White Ball into the garbage. Any good story is going to have foreshadowing for its twists and turns, and uh, specifically Miracle Musical is really good at foreshadowing future events. There's a lot of callbacks and leitmotifs all throughout the album, and I feel like the lyrics should not be an exception there. I have a selection of lines here that directly hint at Betty's death and uh, Simon being a liar in some way, which if you put those two together, it kind of paints the picture that Simon is the killer. Like, if you know what's going on, these lines are, like, congruent with a uh, narrative. So first we have, I was a victim of Magic Apollo, catching my breath as I bled on the ground. So if you assume that uh, Apollo is a voice in Simon's head, like uh, my theory purports, uh, Betty is a victim of Apollo's magic, literally bleeding out on the ground at the end of murders. Uh, and I forgot to mention that during my initial pass through, but uh, this is almost 100% foreshadowing, and it's just kind of weird to overlook that. Next, we have uh, Why Did Murderous Animals Survive? Uh, very clearly foreshadowing that a murder will be happening in the near future. Uh, the rest of the section also calls to other songs that are going to occur, so this one isn't really a stretch either. Just the entirety of Black Rainbows. Uh, I think out of all the songs I've analyzed, I really hit the nail on the head as to what Black Rainbows means. Uh, it's a song about creating a bridge to heaven, uh, which is, and uh, Betty being the Stella Octangula, which is a star in the night sky. We'll see how that's relevant in a space station level seven. And they just come together to demonstrate very clearly that Betty gets like purposefully killed by somebody. But I want to highlight a specific line from uh, Black Rainbows. Uh, I draw the rainbows, you draw them near. In terms of foreshadowing Simon killing Betty, this is like a smoking gun. Uh, she summoned the rainbow bridge, but he will be the one to bring it close to earth by killing her. The only other explanation that might even make sense here is that Simon like lured the killer somehow to them. But I don't really think that makes sense because there isn't any other like human characters demonstrated in the story all we know is simon and betty and like maybe the judge from the mind electric but that's it and i don't think the judge is all too important a character and uh things seem to be sandboxed with just these two next we have fate decides how these columns align and as i elaborated in white ball Columns are designed to hold up the front of a building, which could also be called a facade. It's a pretty straightforward piece of symbolism that indicates that Simon is a big fat liar. And then finally, we have Round the Already Dead, and uh, this is a line from White Ball, sung by Betty, and I think it's very clearly foreshadowing that those two will be dead in the near future. And if you want all the examples from murders, you can rewatch the video because I covered everything that definitely points to Simon being the murderer in this song. Uh, the other sticking point for me is that the murder is never so much as mentioned again within the album. If Simon was framed, the story would probably emphasize how Simon was like screwed out of something or maybe Simon was like confused as to what's going on about his innocence. But what happens is that we see a lot of uh, Simon getting haunted by specifically religious imagery and him feeling super guilty about something. If he didn't do anything, why would he feel this immense sense of guilt? Uh, it just seems weird to me. And then the reason I believe in the uh, there's a voice in Simon's head theory with Apollo and all is part of a uh, dream suite in C major features Simon still expressing his love for the person he killed, but he reckon and he recognizes that it's explicitly his fault but uh, he feels as though she still reciprocates the feelings, which to me indicates that there's some kind of thing where it's like, she would know it's not actually him that's doing this. It's some kind of like facsimile of Simon that's not really who he truly is. So I have another theory as to why the framed idea is so popular. Uh, if you look at the most popular songs on Hawaii Part 2, 
They would be Murders, The Mind Electric, and Dream Sweet in C Major. If you only remember these songs, then the frame theory suddenly makes a lot more sense. There's no baseline for the Apollo theory, no major foreshadowing from the rest of the album, and Simon's battle with an angelic representation of his dead wife is less, uh, expressed. I don't mean to single out the Mind Electric here, but uh, it's kind of taken on its, on its own cultural identity, separate from Hawaii Part 2, and uh, when it was integrated back into the full album, people kind of took the separate meaning that was gleaned by it, the Mind Electric fans and just haphazardly applied it to the rest of the album. Like, the Mind Electric becomes a lot more interesting as, like, a reader if you believe that Simon was framed for his actions instead of just being some guy who uh, actually did the thing he's talking about and therefore you have to retrofit the rest of the album into this interpretation. Like uh, let's take Labyrinth for example. Labyrinth literally makes no sense if you believe that Simon was framed. Like it, I, you could say that Simon's lost his marbles but Literally a lot of the metaphors and symbolism of the song are just thrown in the garbage. Like, it just doesn't make sense. Space Station Level 7 also doesn't make sense anymore if you believe that Simon was framed. Uh, people kind of think it has the opposite meaning to what it does, where like, this is Betty's final song, where she goes into heaven and is free. But, uh, it's not. This is another song about Simon and, uh, yeah, I'm gonna cover Space Station Level 7 next. It's one of the most interesting songs on the album, so, you know, if you want to see me cover that, I think you should hit subscribe, because uh, that's the next uh, Hawaii Part 2 Explained I'm gonna do. And, like, Dream Sweet also loses a lot of its uh, power, because a lot of it is built on callbacks to previous songs, where the message is very clearly that Simon is, like, somebody who's done a bad thing. And so it just becomes, like, noise. Like, it becomes very beautiful noise, but there's no method to the madness anymore. Uh, so yeah, sorry for getting a little ranty there, but I just wanted to release all my thoughts on uh, the Simon was framed theory and how much it kind of messes up Hawaii Part 2's text and subtext and uh, metaphors and symbolism and rhetoric. Uh, if you like watching me talk about Miracle Musical, maybe you should stick around. I already told you to subscribe earlier, but uh, I appreciate likes and comments as well. They help boost these videos in the algorithm. And uh, my goal for 2020, by the end of 2024, I want to get 10,000 subscribers. That's my big goal. So uh, I'm hoping we can reach it. I'm going to try real hard this year. Uh, I think that's been everything I want to talk about. Uh, I've been Luxie, and I'll see you next time.